All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome. I'm Rebecca Swenson, an assistant professor here in CFANS. Um, I teach in the area of agriculture, communication, and marketing, and do research connected to science communication. And I'm part of the Artemisia Leadership Group and here to welcome you all to, Provo to Provost Hansen's seminar, The Fork in the Road. Um, the seminar is part of the Artemisia Leadership Initiative, and our goal is really to empower female scientists um, and build the capacity of our university and our industry partners to address our future challenges. We hope that the seminar series, our mentoring circles, and our professional development training seminar is really a catalyst for more conversation, a way to share tools, a way to improve mentoring, and at the end of the day to inspire some action that will benefit all of us by increasing the capacity of leadership across the board. And it's been really fun to be part of the initiative. It's great to see all of you. It's been fun because of the excitement and engagement of our attendees. We had about 70 to 100 people at our seminars, both in person and online combined. Um, since our last seminar, we kicked off our mentoring circles, which are going to run the calendar year. We've got about 43 people engaged in those. And towards the end of the calendar year, we're going to open those up to a new wave of participants. So if you're interested, please do sign up on our mailing list so you can get the information for that. And right now, our working group is putting together a professional development training seminar for May, which will be a half-day session, um, open first of all to those people who are in the mentoring circles. And then as more spots open up and budget allows, we will open it up to everybody else. So stay tuned for more details on the training session. Um, so I encourage all of you to get involved in all three pillars of the initiative. There's spots for both men and women to get involved in the, the seminars, the mentoring circles, and the professional development professional development training session. So I hope to see all your faces again at one of those events. And today we are here in honor to kick off our spring seminar series with Provost Hansen. Um, Provost Hansen is the Chief Academic Officer for the U of M. Um, she's been here since 2012 and was a provost at Indiana University before that. She is a Gopher native and has got undergraduate degrees in both philosophy and math from the U of M. But her connection and her roots to the St. Paul campus go back even further than that before her undergraduate degree, undergraduate degree days. And I was going to say that, of course, that means that CFANS must be her favorite college. <laughs> but then I saw there might be some other deans in the audience today who might not agree with us being her favorite. So I will say that the St. Paul campus must hold a special place in our heart, right? So please join me in welcoming Provost Hansen for her seminar, The Fork in the Road. Thanks so much. And it really is a, a great pleasure and honor to be with you today. And I, I want to congratulate the college on this initiative. This is a superb thing to be doing. And um, I, I uh, am glad to be participating in it with you. And I'm hoping that we can have some discussion, which I take it is what the, the um, seminar and the lectures are supposed to foster. Um, I used a, um, a, a deliberately ambiguous title, and uh, I'll try to say a little bit about how it is, in fact, descriptive of a particular career path. Um, but uh, first of all, I want to, again, congratulate you on the thoughtfulness of the planning for this, uh, this whole initiative. I was taken by the, the choice of the, uh, the term Artemisia um, for the seminar, and wondering, actually, I've sent notes to some of the, the uh, offices here to try to understand how that title was uh, chosen. You have things on your website, which I had looked at, um, that about Artemisia being an ambitious and powerful leader, a botanist, and a medical scientist. So of course, it seems appropriate. I want to follow out a thread, though, about Artemisia and and Artemis, who for whom uh, Artemisia was presumably named, and and look first at Artemis and then at. Uh, couple of the namesakes, including the Artemisia, who's front and center for this series. Uh, she, your Artemisia, was, of course, named after Artemis, the, the Greek um, goddess, uh, in, known in Latin as Diana. She was the daughter of Zeus and Leto, and the sister, the twin sister of Apollo. Um, she's an unusual twin, however, in that she assisted her mother in the birth of her brother. Um, <laughs> she's just kind of right out there and very competent from the get-go. Um, she, she was, 
she, she's the virgin goddess of the hunt, and you know she has she's often depicted with uh, animals around her, wild animals. She's the goddess of the forests and uh, the protector of young girls. She's because of that often connected to midwifery. I mean, both the story of her brother and the um, and and her you know allegiance to young girls. She was among the goddesses known to be very very strong very, very independent. She does not want to marry. She's depicted as virginal. Uh, and, and part of th the thread you're seeing there is that she, her protection and um, aid of women is tied to her separation from many of the sort of things that might otherwise make her subservient to men, including um, marrying. Uh, but Again, she delivered her brother Apollo, the, uh, the you know incredibly important god in that scheme. Your Artemisia, I think, is Artemisia the second of Caria. Caria was a, um, a, a you know sort of a province of um, in Anatolia. She was the wife and the sister of um, Mausolus. Uh, you, <laughs> another kind of peculiarity. Um, but the genus um, Artemisia, I've learned from, from uh, this college, is named after her, contains over 200 species of flowering plants, including sagebrush, a resilient species, I'm reading from your website, which lives and thrives in some of the harshest environments. Now, the harshest environments, academia, science, um, there's a, a, a subtle and I think very graceful hint that there's a, uh, there, there are some things to be overcome. Artemisia uh, II of, of, of uh, Caria was, uh, after Mausolus' death, supposedly you know, inconsolable, um, she had uh, a, a number of enterprises in order to glorify his name, again, her brother, husband. Uh, she had poets and rhetoricians praise him. She built a gigantic monument, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And it's the, you know, the, our term mausoleum comes from that. It was the marker of the grave the, for, the, the, uh, for her brother, Mausolus. And she's praised for this extraordinary grief that she manifested through those kinds of actions. <clears throat> She pined away for two years and then died. Um, so that was part of her womanly virtue. She pined away and died when her uh, <clears throat> other half wasn't there. Boccaccio in the Decameron, in his section on famous women, says, she's an example of chaste womanhood and of the purest and rarest kind of love. Uh oh, it's... <laughs> We'll just pass over part of that. Um, but at any rate, it is one depiction of the good woman, you know, utterly devoted, actually the other half of, of her husband. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's Boccaccio's reading on her. <clears throat> it's also a depiction that you often find in Renaissance art of her. Uh, they often show her mixing Mausolus's ashes into a drink which she drank every day, and part, partly to remember him, but also to incorporate him, even though in some sense they had half their genes in common already. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So she shared his genes, she shared his bed, and she was just devoted to him after death. But after, that's really not the whole story about her, and you know, maybe all of you know this better than I do, but um, after her brother husband's death, um, she took the throne. And that prompted a revolt in some sections of the satrap. Uh, there were profound objections to a female ruler. So Rhodes sent a fleet against her. She uh, was not so grief stricken that she didn't do some strategizing about this, heard that Rhodes was coming to um, remove her from the throne. Uh, and again, even though she had half her genes in common with the previous rulers, so she might have been just as competent, who knows. Um, apparently she was, though, because she defeated Rhodes. She hid marines in, a, in a, uh, a, a secret harbor that had been built during her husband's uh, time on the throne. 
and, and she you know, kept her army over there. She allowed Rhodes simply to enter their main harbor where they disembarked and went into the marketplace and then they were all killed. Her marines were lying in wait. They took all, the Rhodes, all of Rhodes' ships, sailed back to Rhodes and took it over. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, at this point, you know, they don't, the, the, I, I can't at any rate find any account of whether or not Rhodes resisted her taking it over, but one might say, you still object to a female ruler and think that you can't possibly, she can't possibly be competent because she outmaneuvered uh, those who were unhappy with her being on the throne. She then went on, even in these two, you know, two short years uh, that she survived her brother, to conquer another territory. She hid soldiers, again, near the city she was wanting, wanting to take over. Then she with musicians and a parade of dancers and so on, went uh, down the road near it, marched as if <clears throat> to go celebrate a sacrifice for the gods at, at some grove uh, a distance from the city. And people there came out to kind of look and see what this, this uh, celebration was all about. When they did that, she sent in her army and took the city again. So she was, um, she was, she was not um, without her wiles. What do we make of the story, though, of her um, arc of public and private life? Uh, again, I'm going to be talking about kind of three Artemises here, uh, or Artemisias. Um, this is the second. Her story presents feminine devotion and <clears throat> a certain kind of chastity. She never remarried after her brother husband died. Uh, we noticed that some in the satrap that they were ruling uh, weren't happy to have her in charge, but she didn't let that bother her. She went ahead and, and um, uh, took charge anyway. The story of her rule presents her as you know wily, having a, as, apparently as good a wit as her, um, her uh, brother. And, and that she's determined. She has courage and she has ambition. She, you know, she might well have said, well, oh, Rhodes doesn't like my being here. Well, I'm, and I'm in grief, I'm gonna go away. But she didn't, <laughs> she conquered Rhodes. Um, now, that's your, the namesake for your series, I think, the, uh, or the main namesake that you've chosen. And, you know, and I don't know when she was spending the time on botany, but presumably she was, because that's the other part of her story. In my story, and I'm taking leave here because I saw that what you, you asked for were sort of personal stories, journeys about uh, one's way through life. My story is neither heroic nor um, as clever as hers. Um, and that's part of the reason I'm gathering some light from these mythic tales in order to uh, kind of align with the aims of this colloquium series because I actually think there's, a, there, there's some interesting wisdom in these tales. In my own case, I had um, you know, none of that foresight and none of that ability to plan far ahead for the next move. Um, the, but that, for me, raises another kind of issue that I actually hope we can discuss, the balance between planning and taking opportunities. And uh, you, you do have to find a balance. I mean, I wasn't utterly clueless, but I certainly didn't have that kind of foresight that's become mythic with somebody like Artemisia. Uh, in fact, I could tell you some embarrassing things about that. I mean, I had no idea what I wanted to do for a very, very long time. And I remember vividly in fifth grade when we had a section on careers and we had to come up with some careers that we thought we wanted to do, might want to pursue. And um, I, I had no idea. And the teacher was just looking for me to finish the assignment. So she said, what does your father do? Um, it, you know, I was in, I grew up in a suburb near here and a lot of the uh, mothers were stay at home uh, housewives and so she thought, you know, what does your father do? And so I said, you know, he was taught at the university and she said, why don't you do that? And so <laughs> that's, that's actually true. So I thought, okay, you know, this is an assignment, I'll get the assignment done, I'll, I'll say that. You know, this is, again, a hundred years ago. <laughs> this is a very, very long time ago. Um, and uh, it's before the women's movement. It's before every little girl would have been thinking that she needed a career or might want to have a career. Um, 
uh, I was just a big good student and um, uh, you know was liked what I was doing in school uh, when it came time to go to college though I really still had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do I I went to school here as was mentioned I I, I didn't actually apply anywhere else um, I, you know I again I was a you know, National Merit Scholar and that sort of stuff. So you get, even then, you get a million solicitations from schools saying, come here, come here, and we'll offer you this, we'll offer you that. And uh, my parents said, you're going here, and you're, and you're living at home. And, <laughs> and that is what I did. Um, it would be cheaper. Uh, this was this was in a really a different age when classes were shaped slightly differently. In fact, everybody always talks about my being here at the time when they would let anyone with a pulse into the University of Minnesota, <laughs> and that's true. Um, <laughs> um, but it, but I knew it to be a great university, and it, and it was then as it is now. Uh, my older brothers had gone to the university, and then they had gone on to uh, either one graduate school, one law school, um, and it, it was the ethos in my family that you went here, you stayed at home, and then if you, you know, want to or rise to the occasion, you will go away later, um, and you will finance it yourself. So. Uh, that is what I did. There was so little planning involved in kind of going to school in my family, you know, it, and when you did these things like take the standardized tests and so on, the advice, and this wasn't just my family, this was just, again, a hundred years ago, a different era, it was get a good night's sleep and uh, eat breakfast, do your best. Nobody did the preparation for these tests, so uh, I wasn't although I may have been more than normally clueless, it wasn't that far off the norm. So, uh, you know, I've just followed this path that my older brothers had had and that my parents set out for me. Um, I was interested in a lot of um, things academically, though. I mean, both, uh, you know, science and humanities and so on. It didn't know what I wanted to do for a very, very long time. Uh, it's part of why I double majored. I was sort of trying to keep my options open. Um, but at the point where I was going to go to graduate school, I had to choose a field. Um, and, and that, part, part of the reason I chose philosophy was that in some sense, from my point of view, it kept my options open even longer. Because you could do philosophy of this, philosophy of that. There were lots of ways in which it was a broad field. I chose a graduate school pretty haphazardly. Um, I applied to Stanford, Cornell, Princeton, Harvard, and Pittsburgh. Um, those were the highest ranked schools in my field at the time, and uh, that was sort of planning. I mean, I thought I was going to go to a good school. Um, I picked Harvard in the end because it seemed most likely to have job opportunities for my then fiancé, who subsequently became my husband. I thought, okay, that's in a metro area. He was also in philosophy. He was a graduate student here when I was an undergraduate. Um, it turned out to be completely false. There were not, of course, there were more job opportunities. There were also more philosophers. So, <laughs> so, so you know, there were a lot of people hanging around trying to find philosophy jobs. Um, however, it was it was fortuitous it, because it was the any of those schools would have been fine. They were all great schools in in my field at the time, um, but. Harvard was indisputably the best department in the field, of, uh, in, in fact, in the Anglo-American world at the time. It really, was really the second golden age of the Harvard philosophy department. And you know Harvard, they always you know, write books about themselves. <laughs> and um, and there you will find books about the first golden age when, when James and Royce and Santayana and other folks were all in the department. And when I went, the leading philosophers in the Anglo-American world were there, Quine and Goodman and John Rawls and Robert Nozick, G.E.L. Owen in Greek philosophy, Is Scheffler, Hilary Putnam in logic, Firth in epistemology, Stanley Cavell in, um, in um, aesthetics. Their role, the role they'd play as leading lights in the field in my later job hunt did not occur to me. <laughs> um, but it, it I, again, it turned out to be very, very lucky because that was a very hard time to get jobs in uh, academia. 
And um, Harvard was a juggernaut. It was the only school that just placed all of its students. I mean, they didn't have huge classes. They did, my class had six people in it. Um, but they, but Princeton was equally small, and they didn't place anybody. Uh, so I owed that to you know the, the getting a job really to my mentors and the force of that department, knowing that it wasn't just that they stood on their reputation; they worked at it. Nozick was the placement officer when I was a out looking, and they were really, really good. So, and then this is my first sort of general point on mentoring. <laughs> Be lucky. <laughs> you know, I was I was very very lucky. Um, and, but my tip about that is is be alert to to recognize and be grateful for the luck that you get as you as you move along. Um, for receiving breaks in life that are really shot through with contingency. I mean, we cannot plan everything. Good things happen to us sometimes through no desert of our own. But we should be grateful for it, notice it, and then try to build on it. Um, I also think it helps in understanding the situations where things don't go so well for yourself or for others, that there is a big component of luck and contingency in all of it. So, um, so that's the first sort of lesson I, um, I take. Um, the other kind of embarrassing part of the story I can tell you here is that when I was in Cambridge, I was part of a, a woman's group. This again is the 1970s and, the, and that was one of the things we did. And um, there were, all of the people in this were graduate students one way or another. One was somebody from Princeton who was teaching for a little while at Wellesley. Other, other people were working at Harvard. Others were part of the, um, the graduate school in, at Harvard. Um, and, and I remember being so struck by the story of one of the participants in that group whose parents were both academics in one of the Ivy League schools, actually at Brown. And she had graduated from one of the Seven Sisters and was taking a year off to prepare her application for graduate school. And I thought, really? <laughs> I became, it began not just through that, but through, um, you know, the, I, again, was from this era of, you know, just get a good night's sleep, fill it out, send it in. Um, she was, she had it read by lots of people. I, I think people do this now, but. By, and maybe they all did it then, but I did not know that. Um, I began to be much more aware of my ignorance about the way the world worked, uh, particularly the world of, of academia. I mean, I would have thought, you know, I kind of grew up in academia, but I felt like such a bumpkin. Um, I, I found it very disorienting. You know, I always thought this was sort of something, this is all I had done was basically be in school and, and my family life centered around this campus. Um, but I did not understand the way some other folks approach these things much more strategically. One of the things, one of the, during the time when I was, uh, you know, doing teaching at Harvard, one of my, and was a tutor, one of my two T's for small seminars for undergraduate, was a, uh, a young African-American student from uh, Gary, Indiana. And the two of us shared our sense of disorientation. I mean, he, he had come from a working class family and he was dropped into this setting and it was so different you know, for him, meeting a lot of prep school kids and people who had had the opportunity to plan differently. I, I had the opportunity, I guess, but I just I didn't know I should be taking it. So. That is my, my next point of a general sort. Um, it helps us, I think, as we go through our careers to remember that naivete that we may have had at one stage and that plenty of people we're dealing with have. Don't confuse it with incompetence, um, especially when you meet it in others or when you're thinking about your own life. It doesn't mean you're incompetent. It just means you haven't been in a setting where you can pick up these things that um, that some people um, are schooled in very early. Uh, so, you know, when you reflect on your own path or you're counseling others, there's nothing wrong with naivete. And, uh, uh, you know, to go to my philosophical roots, Socrates always said he was the, <laughs> the what, said that the oracle said he was the wisest man because he, he avowed his ignorance, that he, he um, uh, didn't claim knowledge he didn't have. The important thing, though, is there's nothing wrong with ignorance. It can be overcome. Um, cultural competence, sophistication, all of those things are, are you know, the 
They're learned and acquired. Um, and that is one of our main missions at the university, to help students see what their paths are. So just remember that. We're all naive at various uh, points, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with it. It doesn't, it doesn't mean incompetence. Um, I'll quote from another you know, philosopher that, uh, who matters to me, uh, Thoreau who says, not till we're lost, in other words, not till we've lost the world, do we begin to find ourselves and realize where we are and the infinite extent of our relations. I mean, I think that those moments of disorientation are actually quite useful, and, uh, and it helps us to understand that we have much more to learn. Okay, then I, I, when I, went, I said Harvard was successful in placing people, I got my first job. I, I, I think I was very lucky again in that. There was a real trough in hiring in the field. Um, and for, for many of you are, have, probably have many career paths you could follow. In philosophy, not so much. Uh, so you, you needed a university job if you wanted to stay in that. I mean, we, we talk about all the other skills you get. But if you want to be a philosopher, you pretty much have to be in a university. Um, and so my husband and I were looking at the same time to be able to get two jobs in philosophy in that era, anywhere near one of the, each other, it was really, really hard. We were drawing a lot of 400 mile circles on maps, seeing where you know, we might be able to go. Um, <clears throat> and we really, really got lucky and got uh, jobs in the same place at the same university. Uh, I was also lucky in the tact of another member of the women's group I told you about before, the one in Cambridge. She had taken a one-year job at the Indiana Philosophy Department where I got my job, um, a visiting appointment. And she uh, you know, had to move on at the end of that one-year job. It wasn't until that summer, after I had already accepted the job and was about to move, that we crossed paths again. And she told me the backstory uh, about her time at that department. and. Um, what I might be coming into. It was so tactful of her to tell me this later. I mean, not at the time, which would have been a don't take a job here <laughs> message. I had no idea, but that department had been under scrutiny by the Office of Women's Affairs and the EOAA. <clears throat> Uh, I was actually the first woman they ever hired for a tenure track job, and for 10 years, the only woman there. They had had a couple of people on these one-year jobs, but they had dumped them out and, um, and it hadn't treated them very well when they were there. They also had no women graduate students. Now, philosophy is a, is a field which, surprisingly enough, given that there's no heavy lifting, doesn't have very many women in it. Uh, it sort of tracks physics in, 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 you know, in, the, in the numbers. Um, they had had, actually there was one uh, woman graduate student when I was there, but she, <laughs> she transferred out. Um, and, and she actually was, she was blind and, and so she, she, had, she was treated differently in some ways anyway uh, by the department. And so it was hard to sort out, you know, how many things were going wrong for her there. She transferred to political science. She was interested in political philosophy. But they, but they didn't have any women coming into the classes, and they had never thought. I actually remember somebody else from that women's group who had read for a job at Indiana, and they said she wasn't any good. She got a folding chair at Harvard. A lot of other places thought that she was good, but Indiana just mm, was very problematic. It was a real outlier in the, um, uh, you know, the the. the movement to have more women in these in these fields uh, so as I say it wasn't it wasn't philosophy itself has a bit of a problem uh, as a humanities area but IU had a particularly problematic record but um, and, and as I say I was glad that you know my friend did not tell me that because I was overjoyed to get a tenure track job and have my husband get a job at the same institution uh, it would have colored things differently if I had had to make that decision when I was making that decision. She was basically warning me. And what I discovered when I got there was that there were a lot of older women faculty 
who watched over me. I mean, they, they, I think part of the reason they hired me is because those older women faculty were watching the department. Um, they watched over me with tact, with fierceness, and, and with humor. And it really made the pre-tenure time um, very, very different. So that is uh, you know, my fourth <laughs> general point about this. You know, success does depend on others' help always, uh, whether you know it or not. Uh, so be grateful for that. Try to notice when it is happening and try to, try to give back. It's a bit of a moral obligation given the way in which society is connected. Um, I, I, again, th those, th those, those women didn't say, we got you the job. <laughs> they, just, they just acted as if they cleared the path for things to be fair, and they were extraordinarily supportive. And I will n never forget that. Um, as they watched over the department, the department wasn't uh, always pleasant. Um, I, I, but I, and sometimes I kept notes to myself. I'd write something down and put it in my desk drawer about some, it was a way of venting, but without really venting. Um, I remember the first teaching assistant I had for a uh, general, you know, a large course I was going to be teaching. He actually came into the office and I was sitting behind the desk he took the, the other chair and put his feet up on my desk, crossed his, his legs. I was just, you know, as I was trying to remember this, I was thinking, yeah, there were some really strange elements in those early years. And I didn't say anything to him. And, you know, and I'm not, even today, I'm not sure that was the right thing to do, but I just thought, I will rise above this. Um, he said at that time that he wanted to be co-teaching the course. You know, the authority was sort of constantly questioned. Um, there were, you know, issues of age. There wasn't that big a difference. I was there in my 20s. And, um, and it's the era as well. And, and it wasn't just over, you know, that, that era is not entirely over, I'll say. I mean, you, you may well get questions of authority, uh, even when you have some positional authority. So persevere. Um, there were um, you know, some uncomfortable elements sometimes, you know, in colloquia or something like that, department meetings when some issue about gender would arise, everybody's eyes would swivel nervously to me during this period when I was the only woman. You know, just calm down, boys. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and national meetings in philosophy were sometimes quite perilous. Uh, when, when, until, until a lot of women came in and said, this isn't acceptable, generally the interviews, job interviews, were held in the sleeping rooms of the hotels. Um, and and the, as you probably know, if you read the Chronicle, philosophers and philosophy departments are often in trouble for their bad behavior with respect to sexual harassment. Um, and, and so, you know, a lot, a lot of things that it's sort of, not so good to turn one's attention to, but it's important to remember that those happened. Uh, and, and while I'm talking about that, the, um, the, the way in which the meetings, the national meetings were weirdly perilous, um, I'll mention a, the, the third Artemisia, Artemisia uh, Gentileschi, the, the painter, you know, she's a master of the Baroque. I don't know how many of you know her work, but she's, she has a very famous picture of, um, of Judith killing, um, killing someone. Uh, she's, she's, her, her father was a painter and, and Caravaggio was her father's uh, best friend. The guilds and the academies at that time were, uh, you know, late, um, uh, the, the sort of the beginning of the Baroque period uh, were, were closed to women, but her father hired another artist. Uh, he, he schooled her and he also then hired people to be her tutors. Um, he, he hired this guy named Tassi who had a very bad reputation but was for hire. And he was supposed to give her lessons. He raped the, the teenage Artemisia. Um, there ensued a seven-month court trial because she did not take this lying down. Uh, the suit was brought by her father, as it would have to be. Um, and the transcript, the entire transcript of that court case survives, um, from the court case from 400 years ago. Um, <clears throat> he, he did various things to trick her. Uh, 
into letting him get closer and at one point barged into her bedroom and, and she fought him off at that time, but she was raped. At trial, she was tortured. Um, they put, you know, kind of thumb screws or the equivalent in threads which they pulled on her hands, of all things, um, to see whether or not she was telling the truth. She was extremely fierce and even with the thumb screws on, she um, accused him and said, you can do what you want, but uh, <laughs> this happened. Tati's bad character came out in the course of this trial. There's, there's abundant evidence he may have murdered his own wife. Um, and all the same, it was Artemisia who suffered indignities and pain, even in the course of the trial, as well as in uh, the rape. And he was set free. Um, partly because, if you, if you read the trial, I mean, it's very, it's very interesting. He was protected by the Pope at the time, and the Pope, the bachelor, the Pope, said, you know, he wanted some artists, and artists often had <laughs> bad character, but at least everybody knew Tassi had a bad character, so there wouldn't be any surprises. She was, uh, uh, you know, again, bloodied but unbowed. She left Rome uh, and made an enormously successful career in Florence and Naples. Uh, <clears throat> many of her paintings, uh, you know, an early painting, Susanna and the Elders, it's a familiar theme in, in paintings. You've seen it of these old men spying on Susanna uh, after she has refused their advances. Uh, it's a story of a woman tormented by elders who falsely accuse her then of adultery uh, after she rejects them. And they actually said, did the same thing to Artemisia of Gentilesi. They said, oh, well, she was sleeping with everybody. And, you know. So um, one of the, her, her most famous paintings is this one of Judith in Hall Furness. Um, Judith is, this, is a heroine who's uh, saving the Jewish people by killing the Assyrian uh, general, Holofernes. In, in, Ar in Artemisia's picture, too, the, another woman is holding him down. It's an extraordinarily bloody picture, and, and, and Judith is beheading him. Um, well, he's sort of alert and aware this is happening. It's a, it's a very powerful and obviously very personal depiction for, for Artemisia. And uh, you know, I, I, as I say, a lot of her work is like this. That, that, that is in the Uffizi Palace. If you've um, been to Italy, you may, may have seen it. Uh, but you've probably seen depictions of it. In a way, you know, she's kind of like Frida Kahlo. She brought in the stuff up from her personal life into her painting. And, <clears throat> and it had a particular kind of feminist slant. I shouldn't put it that way. <laughs> it's got to worry the guys in the room. It's just that she, an injustice was done to her, and she worked it out. Even it, and the society didn't, you know, help her in um, in uh, sustaining that. So, so she, but she went on. So that is my fifth point. The moral is that sometimes life is really unfair. Um, but find allies. Stay sane, um, and if remedying the unfairness is impossible, get on with succeeding at what you do best. You know, don't let it, um, don't let it uh, end your uh, capacity to do good work. Doing what you do best is one kind of revenge, actually, if something very bad happens to you. Um, and it's remarkable as a form of revenge, it seems to me, because it's not morally repugnant in itself. You know, we have to. Revenge isn't such a great thing, but this is one where you can actually embrace it. If you just go on, overcome it, do what you do best. Okay, well, again, my story is much less dramatic, not a world historical. I got tenure, I became the department chair, I developed a range of new philosophical interests at Indiana, um, given the circumstances and opportunities that were presented to me. It was a heavy logic department. That was one area I thought, you know, I was kind of quite interested in and was related to my background as an undergraduate, but, um, but that's, those slots were taken and so I, got, I learned a lot of other new things. I made lots of good friends, male and female, in the department and out. So there was in some ways a you know, happy ending. I, we loved our time at Indiana. <clears throat> so uh, that's all, that's all ac an academic career. How, how did I make this move to administration? Um, it was happenstance, sort of. Um, 
if I can pull back another thread, you remember my speaking of my disorientation at not knowing how stuff worked. Uh, I never wanted to be in that position again. I mean, that was very disorienting to me. I kind of always counted on myself to know what was going on. And I never wanted to be in a position again where I felt I didn't understand how things worked um, as I was when I first went to Boston, both about you know, how so society works, how, how the field works. I, uh, so that's, you know, my personality. Um, the, uh, and my circumstances. So, so what, uh, I don't want to not know how things work, so I'm going to find out. My circumstances, because I was the representative woman then, you know, the only woman in that, in that department and, you know, somebody the institution had paid attention to when I was being hired, I got asked to be on a lot of committees, um, uh, task forces, all kinds of things, the sorts of things that I know, yeah, all the women are nodding. Um, <laughs> There are, there, but, but I want to own that in a way. There, there are institutional, I mean, people want representation, and that's fair. Um, so there are institutional, and I have to acknowledge, in my case, personal uh, pressures at, at root. So nobody's to blame for that, and this is, but it is because of that that I ended up doing a lot of stuff like that, way more than would be advisable for somebody who, you know, particularly pre-tenure. Um, I was asked again and again to take on formal administrative roles because I'd done a lot of that kind of stuff. I politely refused for the most part um, because it was the wrong time of life and I did enjoy what I was doing until, um, you know, so I, you know, uh, the, the usual routes from associate dean and dean and so on, I just said, no, I don't want to move into those offices. Uh, the reason I moved into my first genuinely administrative job apart from the department chair thing was because um, I got very fed up in the department with that job. Uh, I was managing a ton of searches. We were, we were rebuilding the department in many ways um, because some people had retired. And, uh, and taking an administrative, I was now another administrative job opened as dean of the Honors College and I was nominated for it, and I thought, this is a graceful way out. I don't have to look like I'm leaving my colleagues. I will, um, I will interview for that, and, and I did that. And it was nice, because I thought, well, they're, you know, pleasant. it was a pleasant job, not too taxing, not, as, not, as, not all consuming the way the, the deanship of a college would be. Very smart students, it was, it was nice. Um, and kind of a dean lit job, and uh, and so it was it was a graceful way out of something else, and it gave me some time to get back to actual thinking about uh, philosophy. Um, but the move from that to provost to then was also kind of weird because that's a that was a major um, move into uh, administration where there basically turned out not to be time for anything else. This is a long story about that at IU. There was some administrative turmoil. Um, yeah, you know, vote of you no know, confidence was pending against the president, uh, and the why is a story we're you know, probably not interested in. But in response to that, <clears throat> there was a kind of reorganization of the administration, and they created the first provost job at the at IU. And and I I was worried about the institution then. That is where we had spent all our careers. We had you know had some options to move. We hadn't done it. We liked being there. Uh, and and I thought, well, this is my institution. I care about this. I, then I was nominated to be provost, and and so I went through the process and was selected. So that that's how that happened. That's been a long time though. I spent you know five uh, years there, and then this is also home to me, so it mattered. Uh, once you get into those kinds of jobs, you get, you know, virtually every day some kind of, you know, solicitation to be a candidate for something. So you, you have a lot of opportunities of that sort. Um, and I wasn't particularly interested in that. But, uh, but obviously, I've been doing this for a long time now. When I think back, even though I'm very, very old, it's a long time. And it's, you know, about 25% of my academic career. That is astonishing to me. 
Uh, I never thought I would go into something like this. But I, I will own it because <laughs> there are reasons that have to do with me as well as circumstances that led me in this path. I didn't desire an administrative career. There's nothing wrong with that, but I didn't, in fact, desire it. Um, but I do have a need to understand what I'm implicated in. Uh, and I care about the institutions that I am going to be associated with. So, um, and I want to care about the institutions I'm associated with. So when various things happen, it makes sense to think there is a rational process for deciding that that's where you'll put your energy. And that is my sixth point. Then the, uh, our, our paths, it seems to me, are not just defined by our goals. They are, um, our paths are, um, journeys, and the journey itself is important. It teaches you things, and so you should welcome the journey. Uh, making it the one uh, you want to be, and you have some control over that. Um, you know, the, the title for this talk was to, to get at all these contingencies, but of course the, the other famous philosopher I'll quote here is Yogi Berra. You know, if you see a fork in the road, take it. Um, our needs vary o over time, by person, just as our desires and abilities and talents do. And it's not a, not a mistake, it seems to me, to pay attention to your needs at a particular juncture and what your talents might be employed to do at a particular juncture, even if that narrows your option. And, and, and every path you take, in some sense, narrows your options. Um, now I'll go back to a real philosopher, namely Nietzsche, who says a certain narrowing, a certain stupidity, is necessary for, for achievements. Moral this is Nietzsche from Beyond Good and Evil. Morality teaches the narrowing of perspectives, and also in a certain sense, stupidity as a condition of living and growth. The essential thing in heaven and on earth, so it appears, is to, uh, that there is obedience for a long time and in one direction. In the process, there comes and always has come, eventually, something for whose sake living on earth is worthwhile. For example, virtue, art, music, dance, reason, spirituality, something or other transfiguring, subtle, amazing, and divine. I mean, you can take some examples there to get at what Nietzsche in his typically aphoristic and um, uh, startling way says. If you think about what a dancer does, they have to start earlier, they have to train. There are things they don't do because they are working on that to become sublime in, in one particular thing. It is a narrowing, but that's all right. That's what great achievements can come from. <clears throat> Opportunities then open up that are partially determined by the opportunities you've taken and the ones you've left aside. Um, I do think there is one, oh, there's a footnote, this is, um, there are many reasons why I'm not a dancer, but, <laughs> but this is also one of the good points of that idea of you take, you're narrowed as you, as you actually try to achieve things. <clears throat> there is a specially wonderful thing about academia that uh, you can sometimes backtrack on lost opportunities, um, make a circle back and return to where you were. You know, take up, uh, you can take up different things in your career, you know, administrative things at one point, back to research at another um, in terms of, of emphases. It's probably true in a lot of other fields as well. Um, and in fact, it looks, these days it seems many people are comfortable with simply stepping off the path they're on and starting over at something else. Um, I'm not, I, I, I don't, it takes a certain fortitude to do that, but I do think we are very lucky in academia to be able to kind of do one thing heavily at one time and something else heavily at another. So let me, uh, highlight one last philosopher making somewhat the same point. Uh, this is, this is uh, Henry David Thoreau who says, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach. I want to mention Thoreau here, not just because I'm in the College of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resource Sciences, um, but it is important that, that Walden is a book that talks a lot about raising food, about eating food, what, it, what uh, kinds of nutrition one gets from, from food, what it means to consume some, some things and not others. He, it is obviously for many people a book about nature and the natural world. Um, but for somebody like me, it is also a book of philosophy. And um, 
uh, you know, as we think of a, a proto scientist like Artemisia, a botanist, you know, she's looking at plants and categorizing them and so on, much the same as Thoreau did. Uh, Thoreau casts um, his going to the woods and living at Walden Pond as an alertness to opportunities, really alertness, that, it, that the issue of alertness is um, a leitmotif through that book. He says he's trying to see what these things have to teach, you know, nature and solitude and, and neighborliness. Um, and there is a circle back you know that that's a profound time living in this small hut and writing that book there is a circle back to other possibilities even for Thoreau at, at near the end of that book he says he left the woods for as good a reason as I came I have other lives to live um, I, I, I just love this passage he says perhaps it seemed to me that I had several more lives to live could not spare any more time for that one it's remarkable how easily and insensibly we fall into a particular route and make a beaten track for ourselves. The sur surface of the earth is soft and impressionable by the feet of men. And so with the paths which the mind travels, how worn and dusty then must be the highways of the world, how deep the ruts of tradition and conformity. I learned this at least in my experiment, he says. He always calls his time at Walden Pond an experiment. That if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected and common hours. That's what I wish for you, uh, and I urge you to take those paths, not fearing that you can't find your way back. So I'm happy to take questions. Karen, thank you very much for that. There was a lot of stuff that resonated in there. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your early days at, in, uh, at IU, where you were the only female faculty member of the department. And other than writing, venting notes in your desk, I mean, how did you, how did you deal with some of the, the culture, the atmosphere that you were faced with in that situation? Uh, I, I think... Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I tried to go about the work I knew I had to do. And of course, I had also other ways of venting as well. If things went badly, if the graduate student you know, treated me like his assistant in the course, uh, I'd come home and say it to, to my husband. But I, it, it's part of my personality not to say, although you know, actually, maybe it was part of my personality then, it may not be now, get your damn feet off my desk. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, it's, you know, I look back and I think, why didn't I do something? I think I didn't then because I, I knew I was walking on eggshells a little bit, and I wanted to make sure that I kept my composure and behaved professionally all the time. Um, so if, uh, I, I, I think, you know, it was, that, that isn't just, that, again, a matter of personality. It may be um, a matter of having a kind of hothouse um, path to that place where I, I took as my exemplars of how you behave in class, my teachers, and I was just going to do the same thing. Wasn't going to get into a tangle about uh, whether or not there were gender issues going on. I was just going to focus on philosophy, and, you know, writing papers, doing the teaching, and being on all these thousands of committees. Um, but uh, again, that was one of the you know, I had, would have had certain outlets, both uh, at home and, and also, again, with this important circle of women who were incredibly helpful. And I, and I just can't emphasize that enough. They were, they were, you know, again, they were not in my field, but they, they allowed a certain looseness. That was back in the days of, you know, we'd constantly have potluck suppers, and, uh, we'd, and everybody was also learning how to cook with Julia Child, so they were, those were getting fancier and fancier. Eventually, everybody just started buying things, but um, 
but, but for a while we were doing that, but they were very relaxed and uh, supportive and, you know, rueful about things and uh, uh, without being, you know, without crossing a line. You, you can imagine that it, it's in, in a way sort of one step further from the consciousness raising groups of the, of the early 70s, but they weren't quite that. They were, they were also professional mentoring uh, with a little steam blowing off. And so that's a, it's a very useful thing for people to have. And it doesn't have to take that form, obviously. Social forces make some things important at some sometimes or make them get configured in some ways at some times but everybody needs a circle with whom they can blow off steam but who are also supportive and also knowledgeable and just don't let it end with steam blowing off So it sounds like mentorship was an important part of your career path. I'm wondering what advice you would give to someone to how would well, how would you advise them to best take advantage of mentors that they have? I'm sorry, say the last part again. How would you advise people to best take advantage of mentors that they have, informal and formal? Well, uh, I, I think there's a you know it's beca it's become a thing. I'm not sure that we even kind of thought of it in those terms then. Um, but again, it's, I feel like I'm talking about the, you know, nineteenth century. But it sort of seems like at that distance right now, where now often people will sort of say, "I want you to mentor me." Uh, that really never happened. But and I'm not sure that's that's not. That's not okay, uh, because what what people did was meet over certain issues, uh, and you know you could see the wisdom of the I could see the wisdom of the older women faculty who had been at that institution longer and knew how things worked, and you know and then you pay attention to it, um, and if you you need somebody to help and guide you, and I got you know tremendous support from my thesis advisors and people like that, you wouldn't have gotten a job otherwise. Um, you, you, you listen to what they had to say and you, you tried to see, you know, match things up in terms of the advice people were giving with what your own aspirations are. And I think if you, it's, it's easy enough to fall into natural relationships of mentoring, men, menteeship, if, uh, if you actually have... Um, that real connection, it's not just that you pick somebody who's in a position of power or something like that. There are actually things you want to achieve and you think, this person seems to know how to do this. Uh, often, you know, somebody who's mentoring wants to do it in part because they do want to impart what they know and they care about, uh, you know, every, everybody who's teaching cares about their students. So it, it seems to me it's, again, alertness uh, that... That's the, the pro part. You be alert to those places where you can learn from others. And often, if you take advantage of that, the, more will come. People like to impart the wisdom they've won so hard. So. I notice we are out of time. So let's okay. thank Provost Hanson more time. <laughs> Thank you.